Hey, you all, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to the No-Till Market Garden Podcast, episode 13. How could I not be excited about today's episode? I had the absolute pleasure of chatting with Elizabeth Kaiser of Singing Frogs Farm in Sebastopol, California, about hedgerows, about bed prep, about ecology and no-till in general. It is a great episode, and I am absolutely thrilled to be able to share it. Paul and Elizabeth have been hugely influential in the development of our own farm, and I imagine after listening to this episode, you will be saying the same thing. But first, if you are enjoying the No-Till Market Garden podcast, consider becoming a patron and subscribing to the Patreon page. That's patreon.com slash farmerjesse, and it can be as little as $2 a month or whatever you can afford. I just need to get that page up to $1,000 per month to be able to sustain this show uh, and do a second season. So go check it out. You can read more about where that money is going over at notillgrowers.com, or maybe you heard about it in the last episode with uh, Kristen Leach of Namu Farm, which... If you haven't heard it yet, it was such a great episode. Anyway, if you love the show and are getting a ton of value out of it, but would like an alternative way to contribute, you can also Venmo us a donation at No-Till Growers. Uh, That's V-E-N-M-O. It's like an app at No-Till Growers is how you can get a hold of us or whatever way works best for you. If you have any questions about donations, hit us up, notillgrowers at gmail.com. Also, just make sure to share the show and subscribe to the podcast wherever you are getting it. That helps too. Okay, you all, the brilliant Elizabeth Kaiser of Singing Frogs Farm. Elizabeth Kaiser, welcome to the podcast. Fantastic. Glad to be here. And glad to have you. I thought maybe we could start with you just telling us a little bit about Singing Frogs Farm. How much acreage do you have under cultivation there? What kind of things you specialize in and uh, that sort of stuff. Okay, fantastic. Um, So Singing Crop Farm is in Northern California. We're in Sebastopol in Sonoma County. We're about an hour, hour and a half north of the Golden Gate Bridge of San Francisco. Um, We're about a 20-minute drive from the coast. So we're pretty coastal, but not, not too, too much. We're down in a low valley bottom. So we're actually a pretty chilly farm for our area. Um, and uh, my husband, Paul, and I, um, our farm is eight acres. However, our production is only on about three acres of that. And the reasons for that are, um, you know, our home is here. We are called Singing Frogs Farm for a reason. We have seven ponds, so those take up a little bit of space. Um, and then we have some wild areas, some bamboo and redwoods um, and oak um, areas um, that we do not farm. But it's about three acres of production. We've been here for almost 13 years now. Wow. Uh, we started out primarily as a CSA farm um, and then uh, diversified. And so uh, what products we specialize in, I would really say, is diversity. Uh, so we have about 70 to 100 different varieties that will grow every year. Uh, we do grow year-round, and that's super important for us. Uh, so our CSA is 40 years a week. That starts um, weekly in May and goes through Thanksgiving, and then it's every other week through the winter. So we just had a box last week, Wednesday, and then we'll have another one next week, Wednesday. And at this point, about 40% of our produce goes to our CSA, uh, and about 50% goes to farmer's markets. Uh, and we love that mix. It's very flexible for us. Um, we have two year-round farmers markets and then another one that we add in the summertime. And then the last 10% go to some local restaurants uh, and a food hub. And the food hub is the only food that goes down to the Bay Area, meaning like San Francisco, Oakland, and so forth. So about 97% of our food stays within 15 miles of the farm, which is really awesome. Yeah, that's really impressive. So you you are all those farmers mar- that farmers market that you pick up in the summer, is that all in that Sebastopol area? Yep, that one is in Occidental, which is about six miles um, towards the coast from us. And then we have a Saturday market in Santa Rosa, which is the county seat uh, for our county, and then a Sunday one in our local town here, Sebastopol. Uh, And we love all of those markets and um, the diverse people. And then our CSA um, is here in Sebastopol and a couple other little towns uh, near us and then also in Santa Rosa. Um, So just in, in sort of our third or quarter of the county. That's great. Did you did you 
How did you all end up in Sebastopol? Was that where you both grew up or you grew up? or? Um, it's actually sort of interesting. Um, Paul and I are both uh, children of divorce, and both we both lived with our moms, but both of our dads lived in Sonoma County, so we knew it well. Uh, that said, we met in West Africa. Uh, so it's sort of amusing. One has to go far away to meet someone from home sometimes. Uh, but we were both in Peace Corps in West Africa, Paul for three years and myself for two years. And then we both did grad school uh, afterwards. I was in Baltimore. He was in D.C. and in Costa Rica. And we most of that time we were assuming that we wanted to live abroad, uh, either South America or you know, sort of India, Nepal. Um, and finally decided we really wanted to live locally um, where our family was. And uh, eventually, through making that decision, it became um, available for us to get some land through uh, family farming connections. So here we are. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, your background in terms of what you were doing in West Africa and uh, what Paul was doing and and how you guys came to meet? Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, so I... I had to escape the United States, so joined Peace Corps as an idealistic person. Um, idealism runs to the core of both of us and also of this farm. Uh, and I had sort of a medical background uh, and worked as a, in public health there in a rural uh, village of about 2,000 people. They were peanut farmers, and they grew uh, millet and rice for export. And... So I did a lot of public health type projects, which also often went into farming projects. So like I worked with women's groups to do sesame farming so that they could raise money for themselves and to send their girls to school. And I worked on a lot of girls' education projects. And um, I worked with older women to do some gardening to increase nutrition for their families and, uh, and things like that. Paul, on the other hand, he was working in agroforestry. Uh, and natural resource management there. And so he worked on bringing perennials into farming systems for nitrogen fixing, for windbreaks, for um, fodder and firewood and tools and all sorts of things like that. And the Gambia is uh, in the Sahel, and there's a lot of desertification from the Sahara that's nearby, so that's why that's super important. And he started a year before me but then stayed um, uh, partially as our relationship started going and started his own farm there, which I was a part of. It was a lot of fun. It was an agroforestry demonstration farm. It was about an acre. So it had live fences and woodlots and fruit trees and all sorts of things like that. Um, the name of that farm was Eastside Farm. Uh, and so then we came back and did our master's degrees, um, and I delved into uh, public health and uh then when we came, and Paul went into natural resource management, part of which was in Costa Rica, working, um, uh, looking at systems and uh, where there were intact natural forests versus artificial forests, i.e. for t- timber versus nothing at all. Um, and we actually tried to buy some property there to do some regeneration and maybe possibly eventually some uh, farming there, but that wasn't possible, and thank goodness that wasn't possible because we wouldn't have seen drug form if that had happened. Um, then ended up back here. I worked as a public health nurse um, with low income, primarily uh, immigrant families for nine years as we started the farm. So I was the off-farm income for the first six years, you could say, um, and I really loved the nutrition aspects. I loved the community aspects. And as we developed our system, which I'm sure we'll talk about shortly, um, I got really excited once there was a link into sequestering carbon because I just feel that climate change is such a vital um, issue of our time. Uh, so I um, step by step moved away from the public health job and um, once it was feasible, have been full time here on the farm ever since. And that's been uh, four and a half years now. Well, let's let's kind of dive into some of those practices because I, I think that some of uh, so people are going to be excited to hear uh, how you guys do things there. So I remember hearing, I think it was in the farmer to farmer episode that Paul maybe said or you said that um, 
you kind of regretted tilling one patch to begin with. And I'm just kind of curious, like if you had the chance now, how would you do it all over? How would you start your gardens or how would you start a no-till garden from scratch now? Well, I can actually tell you there's a patch that um, the prior owners had in blueberries and those blueberries were at this point 27 years old. So we pulled them out last year and we're um, and turning that in, Turpers turned it into beds and then actually it's going to become uh, our newest hoop house eventually. Um, and we sort of, there being three different ways to start a new space. So I'll go over those and then tell you what we did most recently. Um, and, and I say basic ways because, you know, given your resources, given your soil, given everything else, there's a million different ways, honestly, to do it. Um, but one of them is tillage uh, intensive. One of them is uh, time intensive and would, you know, it's really occultation and tarping. Uh, and then one of them is really resource intensive. So the resource intensive one is really sort of your permaculture, you know, you know uh, sheet mulch and then build your beds out of compost and put down, um, you know, straw uh, for the pathways or, or wood chips or something along those lines. And that's really ideal if you want to get going fast. Um, you have a very small space, like if you're a backyard gardener um, and or you have those resources available. Um, but And we tried that in one tiny patch here sort of because we wanted to see the difference. Um, and the difference was that we didn't have any weeds in that area for a very long time. Uh, but after we got into it for years, there really have not been any differences. And when we look at our soil tests and everything else, there haven't been any differences. So it's more what works for you. Um, the second one is tillage, and that's how most of our fields have been created because we were already doing tillage. And honestly, that's going to be how it is for most people, um, where you, uh, you know, do a pass, you know, get, start out with a clear slate, create your beds, you put some compost on top, and then never till again. So that's a way to get started pretty quickly. Um, and like I said, oh, gosh, you know, maybe – 85% of our beds were created that way just because we had started out doing tillage initially. But also, if you're starting with a larger space and, you know, really want to get going, that might be appropriate for you. Um, it also might be appropriate, you know, to do an initial till and work in some organic matter and then create your beds. And I know um, I, uh, a couple of farmers who've done that. And did you maybe do that? Well, we didn't initially, we, yeah, we did maybe, we did that in our tunnels and we haven't done it in our fields. We just kind of stopped and our, we were tilling in our fields. So we just kind of started layering compost over there. So I guess in a way we did. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. <laughs> so it depends on, again, your resources and, you know, your soil and everything like that. So then the third uh, way would be uh, to tarp it, to occultate it, whatever you want to call. Um, and that's really what we've done the last several years as, we've realized, hey, we don't need this pathway, let's turn it into two beds, you know, adding on to field 11. Or, like I just said, this new area that's going to become a high tunnel, um, we tarp them until we had really decomposed the grasses that are there. Um, and that, you know, is going to depend on what you have there prior. We have some pretty hardy perennial bunch grasses. So for us, it takes at least six uh, if not nine months. So it, it, it takes a little while. And then form the beds and um, uh, put some compost on it and just go from there. And I would say in, in if at all possible, um, you know, one of the things that Paul and I believe very much, I love the old adage, um, the farmer's footstep is the best fertilizer. So, for instance, in all of these areas where, you know, we already have a system that's working really well and we're just adding a little bit to it, uh, we will add a lot of quick crops to those areas so that we can really uh, learn it and um, watch it and watch, you know, how is the soil doing and uh, and so forth and so on. So, like, the new beds that were just created, um, it, uh we, we've done uh, three successions now of quick crops, and the reason for that is we just really wanted to learn that area and what its needs are. Um, so a higher farmer footstep in that area, but we will also definitely use that idea of increasing the farmer footstep if we've got an area that's got a, a weed issue or, um, you know, there's something going on there um, that we want to watch. Yeah, a couple things. I love that quick crops, I often recommend when people are fighting Johnson grass because it's persistent, but it's not super fast to seed. I always say grow some baby greens right there because you'll be there all the time, either planting or harvesting. 
and you can kind of pick it out and then you can also, but I, I love that angle of, of kind of learning that area really well. The, the permaculture, uh, sort of option, the, as you said, resource intensive, uh, it's kind of cool too, because a lot of times when we think about the easiest way to get into a garden quickly in a no-till sense, it almost seems like it has to be tillage, but it does kind of present another option that's relatively quick uh, for actually getting into a into a new plot. Absolutely. Yeah, maybe we could t- you could tell us a little bit about, kind of get into that bed prep a little bit, and what are you doing? You're laying down compost, or what's like, let's take, I don't know, maybe some of your, your, your most typical methods. What, what's, how do you get that bed ready for planting? Sure. Um, when we were starting in the first couple of years, when we had dialed into what we were doing, which was there, I can't exactly pinpoint because it was a, uh, a learning process, shall we say? Um, but, uh, we put compost after every transition. At this point, we're really putting compost on only about 75% of the transitions, and we're trying to use as little as possible. Uh, so that that is the goal. That said, um, when we started out, our soil organic matter was 2.4%, and these days it's, you know, 8 to 11%. So, you know, there is, there is a big difference there. Um, and we even wonder how much do we need the compost in. But let's just take the general idea and not the specifics of when we started versus now. So the general idea is you probably got a crop there prior, so you want to take that out and put it in the compost pile, you know, be it a brassica or, um, you know, the extra leaves of some massive cabbage or whatever it is. And so we're going to cut that out at the soil level or just below the soil level, and we'll use whatever tool is appropriate. It might be a harvest knife or it might be some blockers. And uh, so we want to leave the red here and all the roots in the ground, and then we'll take the green above ground matter, put that in the compost pile, uh, and then we're going to, well, uh, prep for the next crop. We might add some very light fertilizers, um, but we honestly, any, anyhow, uh, so what we might add there, we might add a little bit of chicken feather meal um, that also has some manure in it. Uh, and for a long time, we added some calcium in the uh, form of oyster shell. Um, and then we would cover that with a thin layer of compost, and then we would transplant right back in. So it's really very simple. There's, you know, a hundred different other, you know, minor considerations, crop before, crop in, uh, and so forth and so on. Uh, but it's really pretty simple. Cut out the crop. Uh, prep the bed, and then get the next crop right in. And often that can happen within a couple of hours. Harvest the crop for whatever market it's going and get the next one in. That's so interesting. You you mentioned, you know, um, adding a couple other fertilizers, but, and then, but you also kind of just mentioned you talk sometimes about whether or not you need compost anymore at all. How does that conversation go? Can you kind of fill us in on, on what you mean? Absolutely. Well, first of all, we're going to look at what's the crop coming out and what's the crop going in. And, uh, you know, if it's a quick crop to a quick, quick crop, we won't add anything. Cut out of the crop and put the next one in. If it's a long crop, uh, a heavy feeding crop, or another heavy feeding crop going in, say I'm taking out, you know, um, Brussels sprouts and I'm going to put in, uh, you know, something else that's going to be in there for a while or say I'm going to put in tomatoes that are going to be in there for at least six months, then I definitely will, you know, put in a little bit of fert and the compost in. Uh, so that is the main consideration, if that makes sense. Uh, but we'll also think about, you know, what time of year it is and where it is. So in our hoop houses, we may add some light fert. Uh, during the summer when we'll have our cucurbit crops in there or our eggplants. Uh, but then as we get to our winter light greens in there, we won't add anything. So we might finish off with a cucumber crop that comes out, you know, mid, late September, early October. And then we might have three different light green crops over the winter and not add a single thing to those. And then we'll, you know, beginning of March, get more cucurbits in there, for instance. Interesting. Okay. Can you... Talk a little bit about, are you all, you said you're growing year round and you said you have some tunnels. Are you growing in the fields? Like, right, it's January when we're recording this. Are you growing in the fields right now? Absolutely. 
Um, so first, let me give the framework of our uh, climate. Um, so right now this morning, it was mid-30s, and uh, I actually don't know what the temperature is outside right now, but it's, I, if I were to guess, I would say it's about 45 right now. Uh, we got down into the mid-20s last week uh, when we didn't have rain. So we'll usually hit 10 degrees once a winter, and we'll usually have about a week with the nights in the low teens. In the summertime, we will usually have about a week where we hit 100 degrees. Um, and then we have our rains usually uh, starting in October and usually going through about April, and then we're dry for the rest of the year. So right now, uh, this morning we harvested some baby bok choy from the field, some uh, uh, mustard greens from the field, and some bulb fennel from a hoop house. Uh, that I just finished delivering to a restaurant. This weekend, we had probably 20 different fresh harvested crops, most of them from the field. As I'm looking out right now, I'm seeing some kohlrabi, I'm seeing some spinach, I'm seeing several different kinds of kales and chards that are out in the field. I'm seeing Brussels sprouts. We're in the middle of harvesting them. Um, I even have some lettuces outside, some of which are light covered, some of which are not. Um, so we have a variety of crops that we overwinter outside. Uh, it definitely does slow down, hence um, we have about half the size stand at the farmer's market, and we do the every other week CSA, but it's really important for us to grow year-round. And, so, and we are able to, thankfully, so we do. Interesting. And are you all doing any sort of cover cropping, or is that mostly just uh, cash crops? Uh, we don't do much cover cropping at all. In fact, we think, yes, let's keep green photosynthesizing plants in the ground at all times. And if those can be cash crops, you know, that's just great. Now, we do have about a fifth of our fields that go, uh, flood most winters. We haven't flooded yet this winter, but of the 12 winters that we've been here, um, we've had two winters where we've had no floods, plus this one so far, we'll see what happens. And then two winters where we had seven floods. And I'm talking most of the fields getting underwater to about knee deep. Um, so obviously we can't harvest anything out of those over the winter. So they have definitely different management. And so we will either occultate or cover crop those over the winter, uh, depending upon when the crops come out. I had some uh, about a third of that space that we had things come out till uh, into December. But right now there's nothing down there. And so about a third of it just had stuff come out. A third of it has been uh, tarped, and about a third of it has uh, cover crop in it. Um, so that is really the only place that we do the cover crop, um, and for that reason. Otherwise, just keep growing economic crops. Wow, I'm curious. The, when it's flooding, how is – so the between the tarps, the occultation, and the cover crop, that's enough to – to hold your soil uh, there? It is, and it was something that we weren't sure of. In fact, those fields were the very last ones that we transitioned over to no-till because we thought, wow, you know, we're going to create these permanent beds and put, uh, you know, compost on the top, and then we're going to have a flood, and it's just going to all wash away. Um, and so we tilled down there and put in cover crops and had our chickens down there and did, you know, uh, winter squash down there and things like that. And then we, especially through the drought that we had, um, for about three winters, we just sort of slowly continued moving into that space um, and, uh, you know, then had one big flood and it came in and it came back and the beds did great. Uh, and so we said, let's do this. Um, the, the specifics of our flood is that the water is very slow moving through the area, which definitely helps. So it's sort of a gentle rise and it also doesn't stay for more than usually about 12 hours, maximum 24 hours. Um, so they're very light floods, but still we can't harvest out of those areas for food safety reasons during that time. Sure. So you mentioned the transition. Can you talk a little bit about what went into that sort of decision-making process and how you sort of developed your, uh, your style of no-till? We didn't even have uh, the words no-till in our mind. We were just trying to figure out how to farm. Um, so Paul and I, our background was very much in, in in other things as we've already talked about. So when we first moved on the property, uh, the prior owners made it possible for us to take it on. They had had an organic certified farm, but it was really a retirement project, sort of a hobby farm of theirs. And they bequeathed us two tractors and about 
12 different pieces of equipment to go along with that. And so um, the first year we just, um, we first of all had our first child and um, basically had a really big garden and gave away food to all of our friends. Um, and then the second year we started the 20 person CSA uh, and then we grew from that to a 50 person CSA, a 70 person CSA the following year plus farmers markets and then a hundred person CSA and so forth. Um, and uh, so at first we just started doing tillage, um, get, getting maybe two crops in per year, and our sandy soil with uh, low soil organic matter, it just sort of froze up, you know, and then we had weed issues, we had really bad um, aphid and uh, cucumber beetle issues. Um, they just, oh, it was really um, not very fun. And we were getting a little bit better at it. We had a lot of uh, mentors around, and um, but we didn't really like it for a variety of reasons. One was really the ecology. Um, on the day that we moved onto the property, we planted our first hedgerow and uh, then got USDA grants to put in Sonoma County native pollinator-friendly plants and got an award for that and then continued adding. And really loved adding to the ecology and adding to the life. And let's talk about that more later, but just to have that there. And so it felt like we were supporting and growing the life on our farm with that. And then with the tillage, we were really killing the life. And, you know, every time you went out there, you were killing a killdeer nest or a snake or, you know, a gopher nest, which was always the worst thing because that's our biggest pest on the farm. Um, but, um, you know, or the earthworms or whatever it was. And so we wanted to get away from that. And then we also were very frustrated by, um, you know, not – we kept trying to push the seasons because we wanted to grow more and more of the year to have an income. And in the winter, we were getting the tractors stuck in the mud. So we wanted to get the tractors out of there. And then we wanted to keep an employee of ours that, you know, uh, the third year when we were really – um, getting a little bit better. We had 70 person CSA and a couple farmers markets and he was awesome. He lived on the property with us and started his chicken business on the property side by side with us. And we knew that if we were going to till it all under again and put in cover crops, we would lose him. He would move down to Santa Cruz, which was four hours away and probably not come back the next year. And we were, that was not okay for us. So we said, okay, we've lived in West Africa. We've seen people, um, do hand labor. Let's get remove the tractor from this equation and just do permanent more hand labor beds. Um, you know, we talk to our CFA members and we say, hey, we're going to try out doing the CFA over the winter. We're just going to try every other week, um, you know, and just sort of took on half of them, the hardcore members, and we made it work. Um, we did use a rototiller still. We used the old toy built rototiller. We called it the beast. Um, and then, but it was always a third, it was always watching and observing what was happening. And so, and also, you know, trying to see what you could get away with. You know, if you, if it didn't, the soil looks great and it didn't look like you had to rototill it, well, let's try putting in another crop and not rototilling it again. Uh, and so we weren't rototilling after every crop and it became fewer and fewer. And we were um, bringing in, you know, more compost and then adding it to the top. Um, I should also say that a, a pretty major influence for us was John Jevons. Um, that is, you know, how we had both been trained in uh, West Africa, and, you know, we had to, you know, do some double beds there. Um, we only have one bed on the farm that was ever do double dug. Uh, it's a lot of work. But sort of the idea of intensification as much as possible. So even then we were doing multi-crops and so forth. And we got to a point where we realized um, – that we didn't even need the rototiller. Uh, we sort of funny. We had uh, Deborah Kloon Garcia out. She was filming at the very end of filming for the Symphony of uh, Soil, um, and they wanted a shot with earthworms live in a bed that had beautiful food in it. And so you know, we're, oh yeah, we got lots of earthworms. And so we dug through a bed. And, yeah, I said, look here. And you know, the cinematographer was like, I don't like the look of those veggies. I like the look of those veggies over there. Okay. And you know, went over to that bed and dug around. And wait, there's no earthworms in this bed. Okay, okay, let's try this bed over here. There's none here either. Okay, let's try another one. Okay, 
Here are those beautiful vegetables and there's earthworms. Okay, get your shot. Great. And then afterwards, you know, as a farmer, you're going, well, what gives? Why, you know, why very specifically in bed one and four were there earthworms? In beds two and three, there were not. Well, when were they last rotted pills? And beds one and four hadn't been rotted till them at least uh, almost 12 months. So that was the end of the rototiller on our property. Um, we then moved to a light tilter. Uh, it was a project of one of our CFA members who was working with a company in Turkey. Um, we loved that little thing. And bit by bit, then we started to transition to a broad fork. We loved the broad fork. And then, honestly, in most of our fields, we no longer even use the broad fork. So it was really a transition of what do we need to do, how can we grow more crops, and how can we intensify so that, you know, we can, we can, we can work, we can work year-round, we can support, you know, the people working on our farm, uh, and we've just loved it. So there's actually a funny video online from about five or six, no, my gosh, it's got to be six or seven years ago now, um, it's a YouTube, and it's Paul talking about our system, and he doesn't even have the terminology no-till. He's just talking, you know, hand labor, non-mechanized, intensive uh, farming, and that's how we saw it until we both were, you know, just very interested in climate change and started to hear discussions of really no-till and carbon, and then um, just delved into that, and that um, has really propelled forward sort of some of the ideas. It's definitely changed, um, uh, you know, minor tweaks to how we think about it, but also very much how we, you know, talk about it and um, share about what we're doing. Uh, but for us, it was just an observational step at a time moving towards better vegetable production. That's cool. I'd love to kind of dive into that ecology with you and hear – what, I mean, what was it that brought those earthworms there, like, from when you removed the tiller? What's going on when you don't till soil? What's going on when you don't till soil? Well, um, uh, you're looking at sort of the biological aspect of it, and when you're tilling the soil, first of all, there's some organisms, be they earthworms or mycorrhizae fungi, that you are physically, you know, breaking and killing through the act of tillage. But by and large, what you're doing is ecosystem destruction when you're tilling. Um, and, you know, you're taking the aggregates and breaking them up, and those aggregates are being held together to create the community for the organisms, be they the bacteria or the fungi or the, you know, protozoa or, or, or whatnot in the soil. Um, and so, you know, we love it that sometimes our soil is somewhat chunky, um, the tops of our beds. We do not tilt them. I know a lot of market gardeners, they love their little tilters, you know, prepare a nice, clean seed bed. Um, we try to do as much as possible through transplants so that we, um, you know, we can have really chunky soil and not worry about that. We do do some direct seeded crops, and we don't use a tilter. We might rake if it's needed. We also might not. We don't always rake. Um, so we try and keep the soil as chunky as possible. Um, and just disturb it as little as possible. Like I said, most of our fields aren't even getting a broad fork any longer. Uh, they don't need it. The fields that are getting the broad fork are the ones that are the lower fields that are getting flooded, and those are also uh, more of a clay loam soil down there. Uh, so about a quarter of our property is clay loam, uh, and about three-quarters of it is a sandy loam. So just building up the biology and keeping that biology healthy uh, we did some tests a few years ago, um, a really sort of brutish microbiology test called PLFA, uh, phospholipid uh, fatty acid, um, just because we were interested. And so that was, let's see, it would have been about four or five years ago now. And, um, you know, looked in, you know, did a couple of tests in the middle of a couple of fields. And then as a control, did a test in some of our uh, roadways that have a year-round cover of clovers and grasses and are not tilled, but we're also not uh, growing economic crops and intensively managing them. So uh, what we found was that the uh, no-till uh, grassway roadways had very good uh, numbers of uh, microorganisms in the soil, 
Um, but the beds that we were extracting three to eight crops from a year had off the charts microbiology in them. So, um, you know, that just, you know, you're, you're, that just shows that, you know, you're treating your soil well, um, you're getting a lot of new young plants in there in succession, um, and the biology in the soil loves it. I would love to delve into it a lot more and learn more of the specifics. It's actually one of my goals for this year. Um, I asked Santa Claus for a microscope and I got it. So I'm trying to, to learn more along that line. I think that both, you know, people like Elaine Ingram as well as, you know, people, people like Dr. David Johnson have brought a lot to the field and a lot of understanding of how important, um, you know, all of that biology in the soil is. Um, so I know that we have it. I know that we have decent fungal bacterial ratios. I honestly don't know much more about it, and I don't think many people do, if that makes sense. I've had some soil scientists out here, and I show them our tests, and I, you know, ask them questions, and you know, get answers like, oh, 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 no, you know, I really actually don't specialize on that kind of nematode. I specialize on this and this specific nematode under, you know, oak trees in, you know, this specific county. And so I really can't talk about your nematodes on your property. It's just there's so much life in the soil and we're just barely, barely starting to understand it. Um, so through having, you know, not tilling and disturbing the soil, through, uh, you know, following, you know, principles of good soil management, constantly keeping young plants in there, and then also through having, you know, healthy ecology around them. And let's get into talking about hedgerows. That also really, really helps support that. Um, do you mind if I start talking about uh, uh, sort of larger uh, ecology and hedgerows? No, I would absolutely love that. Go for it. Okay, great. Um, so uh, um, on our farm, we have hedgerows sort of throughout our fields. And um, there's plenty of pictures online of our fields from overhead. And maybe I'll give one, you one to post to this uh, podcast. Um, uh, but that is just so important for us for a lot of ecology, for the beneficial insects that feed on our pest insects that mean that we don't ever use a spray on this farm. Um, we use a pesticide spray once in year two against the cucumber beetles because everybody told us we had to and we tried, and it didn't work. It didn't kill the cucumber beetles. It killed the lace wings. Um, and so that was the end of that. Um, but uh, having the hedgerow plants, so you know, the, the bushy perennials, the densely branched um, bushes that are anywhere from three feet in height to eight feet in height. There are a lot of studies through some of our California universities here that show that those are the, the uh, habitats that are prefer preferred by uh, the beneficial insects, the predatory insects. Um, they have a longer lifespan, and so they need a more stable habitat for them to live in. So that's where your lady beetles are going to be. That's where your praying mantis are going to be and so forth. You know, your, your predatory wasps and uh, as well as your spiders and your beetles. Um, they're going to call that home and then they're going out, going to go out and forage. And those different studies that look at hedgerows have shown that uh, beneficial insects will go out, you know, 250 feet out into the field. One study I thought said even 500 feet out. But what we've decided on our farm is, you know, if I'm hungry, I'm going to eat somebody closer to me and not have to go, you know, if, you know I'm, before I'm going to eat somebody farther away. So we don't have anywhere on the farm that has, you know, annual crops with uh, more than 120 feet from a, a hedgerow. So we've just sort of put them all over, also utilizing them for, for wind breaks and climatic stabilization, and I can talk about that if you want. Um, so they are just so super important. And... Um, you know, these days we don't have a lot of pest problems, uh, insect pest problems. Um, you know, we have a couple of isolated problems, one of which is flea beetles, especially in the springtime. Um, but what, that's actually interesting because, um, you know, we are right next to a 140-acre uh, conventional vineyard, and they put in a winter cover crop of mustards and flea beetles overwinter in mustards. Well, come April, they mow all 140 acres at one time, and guess where the flea beetles come? Right over to me, right? <laughs> uh, so, you know, that's just a problem that 
uh, we don't have the ecology to balance that equation, if that makes sense. Um, you know, and then the other problem we have is in our hoop houses in the winter, uh, when we're closing all the doors, um, we are essentially uh, excluding Mother Nature um, by doing that. And so we don't have a problem during the summertime when all the doors are wide open and uh, the sides. But right now, you know, every day we're opening and closing them more than anything else to, you know, get airflow and, you know, get Mother Nature in there as well. Hey, you all, just going to jump in here real quick and say that if you're enjoying this episode of the No-Till Market Garden podcast, please share it with your friends in your Facebook groups, wherever you can. Also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash farmer Jesse. You can also PayPal or Venmo us a donation to the show to keep it running or whatever works best for you. Also, don't forget to subscribe and go check out notillgrowers.com. All right, that's it for me. Thanks, you all. Let's get back to Elizabeth. A couple things on that. Uh, the the you know the flea beetle thing is really interesting thinking about i always say to people that the you know farms are not containable by rusty barbed wire or deeds you know they're very inner interlinked so when your neighbors are doing something you know it's it can wholly affect you but i want to talk i'm hoping that maybe i could get you to get into hedgerow design and kind of explain that process a little bit for us um not just design but also how do you set it up in a way that it's not going to become a weed bank? Um, well, first, I guess I would say I don't feel like we have a lot of weed issues with either weeds getting into the hedgerows or being perpetuated um, by the hedgerows um, with one exception. So when we got the USDA grant to put in the 3,000 Sonoma County native pollinator-friendly perennials, um, we were – we had to work with a consultant who helped choose those varieties, and she very much wanted to put in one row of tender perennials, and we were not so happy about that. We, you know, we, we talked with her about it, but, you know, we're like, we've got these bunch grouses, and they're just going to grow in, and when these die back in the winter, we're going to have a weed issue, and she really wanted to do it, and so we said, okay, fine, let's do one of them. Well, that one has been a weed issue, so bit by bit, um, we have been reworking that one. Um, but uh, so let me talk about how we install them, and maybe that will um, answer the question or, um, or, or something. But um, ideally for us, and we've got, you know, the summer dry period, um, we will decide, you know, hey, we want to put in a hedgerow in this area um, ahead of time. And ideally, you know, even still, in the prior rainy season, so like right now in uh, January, it would be great, or even April, to say, hey, I'd love to have a hedgerow here, and just even start to put down a mulch. And we like using a straw mulch. We're in California, so one of our resources here is uh, a rice uh, straw, which we really like because it's very, uh, um, it, it holds together in flakes really well. So we will just lie down flakes where we're going to want to put a hedgerow because it's really going to keep that soil moist and, um, you know, it's it's basically tarping, so you're breaking down whatever is there, and the biology loves it. And then come late summer, so towards the end, but not all the way at the end of the dry season, we'll pull those apart, you know, uh, dig open a hole, put in uh, the bushy perennial, you know, maybe put in some compost, and then cover it all up, water it really well, um, and then continue with a really thick layer of straw. And I'm not talking pulled apart straw, I'm talking straw flakes. And then, you know, water it by hand one or two more times. Um, we don't want to lay irrigation for those because that's a lot of infrastructure and expensive. And then the rains will start up and those will take um, it through the winter. And then the next spring it really starts to grow. Um, and that next summer, we might come through, depending upon how hot and dry it is, and, you know, hand water it maybe once or twice. But at that point, it's really pretty well established. Um, and the straw is working to keep down the weeds in that area. Um, and we will leave it like that for quite some time. I'm trying to think, um, I mean, most of our hedgerows went in 13 years ago and 11 years ago. So it, it's, it's a little while ago, but we, we even just put in one last summer. Um, so, you know, maybe a year or two after, if there starts to be some weed pressure, we will go through, and um, I can't actually remember weeding them, 
but, you know, putting in another layer of straw to suppress it. We also have used landscape fabric. Um, and then we will actually um, manage them. This is a little bit differently, but starting maybe year three by pruning them up a little bit. Um, uh, and that is partially because I mean, hedgerows are uh, awesome. They're really amazing. They bring in all sorts of great ecology, but I'm not going to tell you they're the silver bullet. There are a couple of negatives with them, and one is that if it's really nice and bushy all the way down the ground, it's a great rodent habitat. Um, and so we prune that up to um, make them feel sort of uncomfortable in there, right? Uh, and so they don't like it in there if we've pruned it up, say, 24 inches, but you know who does love it are the snakes. Um, and so it becomes a really wonderful snake habitat. Um, and at that time, we might need a little bit more straw mulch. Um, and then every couple of years, we will go through and do another prune up. Eventually, you don't have to because they're no longer putting on the lower branches. But that's how we manage them. Okay, yeah, that's cool. You guys harvesting anything out of the hedgerows food-wise? Um, not very much, and I wish it were more. Uh, and that's partially because our first hedgerow, really, they were just things we were playing with and cuttings before we moved on to the property, and it's like, let's get them in the ground. And then the grant we got, um, those were Sonoma County native pollinator-friendly plants, so that was sort of the focus. And that's really super important um, because we want to support our pollinators, and a lot of um, pollinators or uh, insects that pollinate are also otherwise beneficial in, in terms of being predatory. Um, but I would love to have more economic crops. We do have some medicinal elderberry, pardon me, elderberry, um, and that's really wonderful. Um, I uh, harvested a lot after, out of the very first bush that we put in, um, and then we've done cuttings from that, and we now have an entire new young hedgerow that is all medicinal elderberry. Um, that's a great crop to have. Um, you know, and we've tried a couple of little things. We've got some tejoa guavas in them, but that's just one small crop of a fruit about Thanksgiving time. Um, and we've had some quince that didn't work out really well. Um, uh, we're starting to get more fruit trees in. And the hedgerow that um, actually they put in last late summer, we were planning on putting some fruit trees in, uh, in and amongst it. Uh, and I would love to see more of that with sort of a lower managed, uh, you know, perennial, um, pardon me, native pollinator friendly, uh, hedgerow and then sort of a higher fruit tree. And, uh, we as a family actually visited an orchardist in, um, France, uh, a couple of years ago and she was trying to, uh, keep all sorts of heirloom varieties of different fruits going. And, but she was also very interested in hedgerows and she did a very interesting thing in, about four different hedgerows where she planted a row of higher fruit trees and then in between them um, she planted other fruit trees that she pruned down into a hedge and she used I think it was primarily cherries and hazelnuts if it were me again I would do native species um, but I really really liked that idea and so um, we are going to try that in one place on the property um, another thing is that we have worked in some fruit trees along the north side of uh, a couple of our fields, so just at the ends of the beds on the north side. So they're getting irrigation with uh, our annual crop, um, but they are not shading them out. They are shading the roadway, which is going to help keep the roadway um, uh, green longer throughout the year. Uh, so, yes, I think there's a lot of possibility for getting crops out of your hedgerows. Yeah, that's that's neat. I um, I, before I let you go, I want to just hear a little bit about the potential of a farm like yours for carbon sequestration. You'd mentioned earlier that you were passionate about climate, you know, uh, climate change issues, and I'm wondering, in terms of carbon sequestration, how much you you all know about how much you're able to sequester farming the way you do, and just some general thoughts about that. You know, a lot of it is just. Uh, you know, let's get the carbon back in the soil. And um, you know, some people were somewhat critical of us at first. They said, well, your soil organic matter has increased so much just because of all the compost that you've added to it. Um, you know, where is that carbon coming from? Is it labile carbon? Is it more stable carbon? How deep is it? You know, because you want more stable 
carbon in order for it to, you know, really have lasting effect. And we did a couple of, you know, calculations, um, just, you know, writing down how much compost we had purchased, how much space we had, and what our increase in soil organic matter was. And we think that about a third, a quarter to a third of our increase in soil organic matter can be attributed to the compost. Um, the rest is all attributed to soil management pre- uh, principles, so, you know, keeping constant, you know, green photosynthesizing plants in the ground, not tilling, um, not pulling out the roots, um, and so forth and so on. And we've also tested our soil down to three feet. And so, in fact, actually, all of our soil tests we do um, no higher than, um, you know, sort of six to nine inches. So often soil tests will tell you, you know, these are the top three inches. And we just always felt that that doesn't make sense. That's not where the root zone is. And if we're top applying compost, we're just testing our compost. Um, so we found that uh, two years ago we did the test all the way down to three feet, and our soil organic matter down at three feet was uh, 3%, which is, you know, we, we do have a clay layer down there, which is higher than our soil organic matter was at the top. And it very quickly went, I, I don't remember, and I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but it very quickly went, you know, sort of every six inches from three feet down, you know, like three, three, three and a half, four, four, eight, you know, six, and then it jumped up. And the, the top foot and a half was really quite high. Um, so, you know, I feel that um, it is one of many, many different answers. Um, we need to stop doing sort of extensive farming on land that is tilled for part of the year and left fallow um, for the rest of the year that has very little organic matter, which is something that we are very much faced with if we drive around California. You just see, you know, you'll just drive through acres and acres of um, agriculture and also um, you know, what other things affect, uh, uh, you know, greenhouse gas emissions is transportation. I want to feed my local community. And so, um, you know, part of it is the soil, but part of it is, hey, let's get out of these huge extensive farms that, you know, may not be working for us and get smaller farms that are closer to the community, that have more connection with the community. Um, and so I definitely feel, really feel that that is a portion of it. Um, we did just do some tests last autumn on, you know, some more, you know, labile versus stable carbon, and they haven't come back yet. Um, So definitely still probing and trying to find out more on that. Um, But, you know, the more we can talk about tillage um, and reducing tillage, the better. Um, And we're also involved, um, you know, because Paul and I have talked about it quite a bit, especially in California, we've uh, made a couple people uh, other larger scale vegetable growers, you know, interested in trying to uh, talk about reducing tillage. So we're a part of a group with some larger scale vegetable farms that are trying to figure out, you know, doing lower crimp veg or um, uh, fewer passes of tillage or different tillage and, and what that looks like. So, um, again, many, many different answers. Elizabeth Kaiser, this has been great. Great. Fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate the uh, the insight from Singing Frogs. Well, you know what? Actually, I have to say a big thank you to you because, you know, I think a lot of people are very interested in it and, you know, maybe don't think it's feasible. And um, getting information out in lots of different ways is really helpful. So I really appreciate that you're going out to many different people who – you know, are doing low-till, no-till in different ways um, and sharing that because that's how we're really going to grow and get better. Um, So I'm just really thrilled for the direction that we're all going, and um, thank you for that huge part that you're playing in that. Well, thank you. All right. Can you tell I was blushing a little bit at the end? I feel like I was blushing. Anyway, if you enjoyed this episode, you can find more info about Singing Frogs Farm at Instagram, at Facebook. They have amazing talks all over YouTube. And they did a really excellent interview with the late, great Chris Blanchard on the Farmer to Farmer podcast, which I recommend. Actually, I just recommend binging on all things Singing Frogs. You you just won't even kind of regret it. 
You also won't regret becoming a patron of this show over at patreon.com slash farmer Jesse. Subscribing to the podcast or sharing it with your friends is good too. Blast it out. Shout it from the rooftops. Pass it along in a note in class. Whatever. That helps too. But also don't forget, we need to get the Patreon page up to $1,000 a month to go with a second season of this show, which the first season ends in May. So just think about that. All right, y'all. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye.